very careful and make sure that everyone's aware of it before you do anything stupid. Um, still got to be professional. The only reason I did it really is because it was in context of a Viking, kind of. Um, and just to finish off, this was my last, this is one of my like personal practices that I did maybe a month ago. Um, it was actually, I was kind of just doing it to get a bit better at my um, polish and just practice on a different rig before we went into the feature we're currently working on. Um, like full, at least full into production. We started this project in October or something, development wise. Um, but this was, this is one that I kind of wanted, one of the tips that I had, I got a review from um, the animation director for Into the Spider-Verse, um, Josh Beveridge, and he gave me some really good advice when he reviewed my reel at a talk, there was a conference and he was there, and he said one tip that he would like to see in my work is it's important to know when not to move just as much as it is to know when to move. Um, and he's all about like making sure that everything feels natural and genuine, but sometimes those subtle like um, internal thought processes is just as powerful as doing an actual action. And it was something I was aware of, but I knew that I wasn't like fully executing and being conscious of when I was animating. And so I thought it'd be fun just to try and do something a little more subtle and internal. And so I found this clip from the movie Get Out and there wasn't much, I deliberately didn't look at the scene from the movie. I tried to avoid the actors acting because it could like uh, cloud your vision when you actually go to film, uh, go to animate it. So I just grabbed this audio and it was really long. Um, it was about, I don't know, it was about 15 seconds or something like that. And there's only two lines in it and they're very short. So a lot of it was just a very long pause about like internal thought process. And so I thought that'd be a fun one to do. And plus I liked the idea of a character smoking because so many people like smoke in different ways, the way they hold a cigarette um, and that kind of thing. I just thought it was, it's a very like intimate thing and personal thing to a character. And so I thought that'd be fun to play on. And that's why I chose this dialogue. So I'll just play the layout for you now. It's literally just one pose. <laughs> but it's just to listen to the dialogue. So all it is, is one character saying off screen, um, do you know how bad smoking is? And then there's this very long pause of the character thinking about it. And then at the end, he just says, yeah but the way he says it is kind of confident. Like he's, he knows it's gonna kill him. But I wanted this change in thought process. So at first when she says, you, you know smoking's gonna kill you, at first he's just like, oh yeah, it is. Like, but, and then there's another beat where he's like, but I love it so much. And then, I, and then by the end he's just like, yeah, I know, but it's gonna kill me. Like it will kill me if it wants to, that kind of impression. And I just wanted that, Sort of like changing mindset from like concern to like actually like a changing point and then to yeah I know I know, I know my decision. Hey Aaron, so, was that just yeah. one pose you were looking at? Only just that was one. no, it was. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't want to. Dis I, I didn't want to confuse people. <laughs> Is my yeah. layout literally my layout was one pose? <laughs> it was more just to show you the dialogue. And I do show you this for this one. I can show you my actual um, progression. So the first thing I did with this character was I just looked at some expression charts that I could use as a range of range of expression um, as like a library template, which was just going to help. The reason I do this is because it helps make the um, face feel connected. So even though I'll still use my own my own poses when I pose expressions, I use this as like a dial back and forth to make sure that even though I've posed the brows, that they're still anatomically feeling connected. Um, and like when I squint my, ch when I squint my eyes, the cheeks are going to pull a little bit and just, I'm kind of starting to implement 
polish slightly earlier on, just so I'm aware of it, even though I'm going to go through and do a cleanup pass and do it properly later. It's just, it helps me get a broader range of expression and a bit more contrast when I'm posing out in my key poses. So that was my template just to kind of work from. And then I used Ray from CGTarian. And then I just basically created those expressions. And then I was thinking about the anatomy of a human. So I was actually pulling around the controls how our face actually pulls. One, th one mistake I used to use a lot was just, I would pull the controls around in a way that would make the shape that I wanted. But when you see that in motion, it starts to feel really disconnected. So I was trying to think about how the cheeks actually pull in, how our lips actually flare out when we talk. So if we go from like a ooh to an ah, I'm actually looking at how those controls would actually move. And we tend to have this like spherical shape, uh, like cone, we tend to have cones to our face, which like around our uh, skull and our eye socket. So when those things pull, I'm thinking about how they actually pull in real life and that's gonna help influence my poses. So using this kind of like library template expression helps with all of that. So this was only on this production that we're working on now have I started to implement this technique and it works really well for me. Um, I've tried to use it with people I've mentored as well and it's worked well so far. <laughs> so I guess it each their own, but I, I think it really helps, especially when it comes to polish. So you'll see that a bit later. So this is me just finding different uh, poses. So I was looking at inspiration from different movies of how people would hold cigarettes um, and like how they'd hold a lighter and put it like lighter, like a cigarette, how they'd put the cigarette in their mouth, how they would blow out the smoke, all these little things. Um, and I just found it quite useful for poses. Like this one from Breakfast Club, you can tell he hasn't smoked a cigarette before the way he held it. And then you can tell this guy is kind of overperforming. Like it was subtle things, but like I thought it would kind of help sell the gesture. I wanted it to feel natural. So Chandler <laughs> loves to smoke if you've ever watched Friends. And just it feels very natural to him to have a cigarette in his hand. So this felt quite natural because he's just the posture in his hand. Um, and I wanted it to feel like my character had been smoking for years and he knew it was bad for him, but he kept doing it anyway. Um, so those are just kind of the research I was looking into. And there was a nice clip of Heath Ledger um, smoking. And I kind of used that for the way he kind of held the cigarette in his hand and put it into his mouth and that kind of thing, took it out. And you'll see that in a minute. So I think there's one more. So this was just how someone might sit outside on the stairs. I didn't copy this pose completely, but it was just for inspiration, just to see how someone may naturally put their feet, like rest their feet, that kind of thing. So that's that was just the reference that I thought was quite natural, the way he kind of, it was subtle, but I was just looking for the polish like in the way that he'd put it into his mouth and then he would slowly relax his fingers and then he'd put it like clench the cigarette again in his fingers and then take it back out. I thought that was quite nice. It just had a cool timing to it and it felt natural. So I kind of used that as inspiration as well. And then I went a little bit method on here. I'm not actually a smoker. I used to smoke years ago, but I grabbed a packet of cigarettes and I thought I wanted to get I just wanted it to feel as close as I could to what I was after. And so I went outside at like midnight when it's freezing cold outside and got a cigarette and then just sat down and tried to act it out. And this was the take that I went with. And I was quite happy with the final expression where he's kind of smug about and I liked how because the way he said yeah I liked the idea that he spoke out one side of his mouth slightly um so I tried to get that in there it makes him feel a little more cocky as he's saying it he's just like yeah I know 
kind of thing. So this is my first first blocking pass. And this is adding in betweens. More in betweens. So this is part of my workflow. Some of you will already be aware of this through different talks I've done with either Eddie or other people. I know some people have already seen some of my talks. So my workflow tends to be I block out in steps, then I add in steps on in-betweens, and then from there I put my scene all down on twos using Twee Machine and like several hotkeys to help speed up the process. And then I usually I put it onto twos so that I have full control over what I'm doing. And then I use a tools or an inbot, either one does the same thing for what I need um, to help clean up my pass on each curve and then add in the extra layers of um, complexity into the body mechanics and add in the secondary actions and that kind of thing. Um, but this, so this stage is where I add it all on twos and then I'll do a cleanup pass in the next one. Uh, sorry, that was around. So this is my two. My, this, is, this is my pass where I put a keyframe every two frames. So there is. I'll once I've done that pass, I'll go through and I'll give myself tons of notes. Um, things that are working, things that aren't what things to focus on mostly in my next pass as I start to clean things up and retime. And then I'll add in subtle notes that I just want to keep in mind later as I go into polish. So one of the main notes that I remember writing down for this was it felt too soft. Like it didn't feel like there was enough weight. And so I took out keyframes here and there to tighten up my spacing to make him feel a little like he had a bit more weight to him and just tighten, tighten everything up a little bit. And then I'd also do like a connectivity pass where I'd start to add in a bit more involvement in the shoulders. I'd be thinking about how much pressure there is on his arms because one rests on his knee. And so I'm thinking about things there. And I'm just thinking about generally how much weight is being distributed in different places and how each part of the body influences another. So this is my next cleanup pass. This is still on twos. And this will be my first. Then after that, I'll hit spline. And I'll go through and see what's not working in spline. And then I'll, again, change the spacing, make sure my arcs are working, all these things. So then I did a talk with Anim Dojo um, about, fa about face polish, um, which is another thing that I tutor on, which is like a live stream thing. Um, and basically I just, in this pass, I did a, like I did a pass on uh, the eyes and making sure that the brows would feel connected as well. So every time they blinked, there'd be a subtle connection with the brows as well. I'd be thinking about how the brows connect together, the sharpness of the timing on them. I'd be thinking about in a blink, the timing of my blink, um, and how the cheeks would press with it, that kind of thing. So this is the next pass. So, this is when I started to do a body polish. So I was starting to clean up things. Um, again, this is where I was saying a bit more about making sure the shoulders are involved, making sure that things are ever so slightly offset up the spine. Um, generally, I would study a lot of anatomy for this kind of thing. So like how a spine actually works, how much influence goes up the spine as you twist and turn. Um, 
like I've been thinking about the timing on the head, so how much like it, how sharp the head darts are, and that kind of thing. Um, thinking about the fingers and how much like they would interact with the lighter. So as he like takes, he basically swaps out. He swaps hands between two different objects, um, as well as he takes one out of his mouth. So all these little interaction things, I'd be thinking about how the fingers would like grip the objects and how they would transfer from one thing to another, that, that kind of thing. So this is the next pass. You can see it's slightly sharper now, the timing in the body goes slightly. So I think this is where I started to add, I was again doing a bit more of a connectivity pass on the face. And so I would start to use the mouth I was thinking about the arcs in the corners of the mouth. I added a secondary action so that he kind of tokes on the cigarette. Um, he takes an inhale, like halfway through lighting it. So he's trying to light it, essentially. Um, and so there's a slight flare on the lips to show that he's uh, inhaling, that kind of thing. And so to help with that, I would chuck it on wireframe so that I can see exactly what the vertices are doing and how the, sk the skin is pulling around. So this is another pass I did. And then I think this is the final one that I've got to. I haven't finished it, I still want to polish it more. I kind of just put it on hold because um, actual work was starting to get more intense. And so it's, it's here when I want to continue it, but this is where it's up to at the moment. I'm quite happy of how the body is generally, like I quite like the connectivity in it. I'm looking at this for the first time in like months as well. So I'm seeing this as just as fre fresh pair of eyes as you are. <laughs> but I think I'm generally quite happy with it. Um, just like the way he says, yeah, I'm thinking about, where is it? I'm trying to find it. Just a subtle way, like the body retaliates and the neck comes back down again. So there's a little overshoot on the neck and it settles back in. Little things like that to just help the polish. Um, one thing that just that already catches my eye, which I don't like about this so far, is there's an eye dart there. There's like a slide on the eye where it looks like it's changing direction, but it's too linear. It just feels a bit weird. So I'd have fixed that but that's another note I can add for when I go back to it. Um, that's pretty much everything. Is there any questions? Thanks for that, Aaron. That was amazing. Um, You're welcome. Mina asked, how do you manage um, to work on personal projects besides work, before or after work, or more on weekends? This one sounded like in between work, was it? This was during work. I've, I don't think, well, touch wood, thankfully I haven't been out of work since I started. Um, so I've been animating for five years now nearly. And uh, yeah, I've always, whenever I've done personal projects, it's always been during work. Like, I, that's why it took me so long to finish my Spider-Verse fan project because it took about three months, but I think I only spent about, at least in animation, I spent about 20 hours on it over three months. So like it just, cause I had to do an hour here or there. I remember working my lunch break sometimes, um, at, the, at least in the early stages of that shot. Um, with this shot, I don't know how long I spent on it. A couple of weekends kind of thing. Um, so probably, I don't know, maybe six, or seven hours, something like that on and off. Um, like there's not a whole lot going on in the shot. Most of it is polished. Like it's very subtle, so it doesn't require too much like labor-intensive like body mechanics to figure out. It's more just how it all connects. 
um, and being really analytical about it. So a shot like this didn't require as much time into it, but I do have an ongoing, if it helps, <laughs> to make this feel any more realistic. I do have a personal project, which is a 30 second sequence, an acting sequence of two characters interacting. And it's like the cut, there's about 11 cuts in it or something. And I started that maybe, I'm gonna say about eight months ago. <laughs> And my workflow has changed so much since then that actually last weekend I went back into the shot and I'm redoing so much of it. Like the performance is there and I'm happy with the acting, but I'm having to redo my workflow completely because it was wrong before, at least the way I see things. And so since I've learned so much in that time, um, working on this current movie and just the tips from dragons and stuff, I started the shot before I started dragons. Um, I've postponed it so much because I'm so focused on what I'm doing at work that I haven't been able to continue that. But it's one of my favorite things I've worked on, at least personal project wise, I'm really into it. And I just haven't had the time to do it because I'm either doing a talk like this or something else. And so I, yeah, but to answer your question, I've, I haven't been out of work. I've just, ever done, I've just done projects in my evenings, but it takes its toll sometimes. You've got to pace yourself. So that's why I haven't touched that shot in like three months. <laughs> I think I've seen some of that and it's, you know, it's a beautiful shot, beautiful sequence. Thank you. Um, You're slowly getting there. <laughs> we can uh, have another webinar for that one. Just, uh, <laughs> you can break it down for us. Go for it. I'll be happy to. Um, there's a couple of questions here. How can one go about learning acting for animation and how do you get better at it? Um, and for facial expressions as well. So for getting better at acting, that's a difficult one for me to answer because I'm not the best actor when it comes to animation. I think a lot of it comes down to, at least when I've ever approached a shot, I'm just thinking, I'm trying to get into the mindset of the person I'm animating. I'm just, like I say, I'm trying to break down and just like decipher how much how much I can of who that person is um, and how they move like what kind of gestures they have um, like one thing I forgot to mention to you guys with Hiccup is the animation supervisor uh, that we had he also works on the other three dragon movies so he was a massive massive asset to us and one thing that he said about Hiccup is in the first movie, the way they tried to establish Hiccup was his gestures were never his own. He was, because he's quite awkward, he was the most non-Viking person in a, Viking, in, in a Viking civilization kind of thing. And to make him feel like an outsider and feel like awkward and, you know, he, was, he wasn't like this strong, assertive, dominant kind of person. He was very timid and shy and insecure. And so to do that, to make himself to try and fit in, he would look at the other Vikings gestures and he would try to copy them. And so that's why he comes off as awkward. Because when he's like, you can see he's this like, in the first movie, he's this 12 year old short scrawny kid and he's like, I'm a Viking kind of thing. And he's, cause he's trying to mimic other people's gestures. Um, and that continues throughout the series which is why he tends to do these like scattery kind of movements and like gestures of his hands because he's never really like found his own thing. He's only copied what he's seen from other people. So his body language is almost a collage of everyone else, <laughs> which is what makes him feel almost that this is his personality. That kind of makes him his own thing, but he never really has one set in stone way of moving. He's kind of just, inheriting different things that he's seen from other people. And so when we was acting for the reference for that kind of thing, I was thinking about that. And I was trying to keep that in my mind is that he's kind of, okay, where would he have seen a gesture that might someone might, someone else might do in this situation. And then maybe that would work on him as well, which is where that whole thing with his hand come to the side came from. Um, Cause that's not necessarily something that, 
I don't know. I didn't see that as something that naturally came from Hiccup, but rather he maybe has seen that from someone else. And I was like, actually, that's quite fun. So he just kind of throws it in there. Um, but in terms of actual like classes for acting, I honestly, I wouldn't know personally. I'm sorry, I can't answer that any better. The only time, most of, at least most of the animators I know have just gone through studying. So I study actors, actual actors, um, and see how they emote, when they're moving, when they're not moving, how they're moving, because they do the exact same thing. Like they have different methods, of course, and a different mindset. So when to how we would move a character, um, but there also are similarities in ways as well. And so it's always good to study them and see how they're performing, and it might help inspire you. Um, one thing that I always do now is I, I, if I get a voice actor, I'll I'll look at the content from the voice actor himself, be that recordings when he was actually delivering the dialogue from the shot if we provided with that sometimes or if it's just something else they've been in that's somewhat similar to the character they're portraying in our film um and i'll study their quirks and see if there's anything that they bring to the table um because at the end of the day when we're acting we're not trying to be ourselves we're trying to be someone else so it's good to study who that person is um i also study a lot of animated shots more from execution perspective, like in terms of the principles, that's mostly what I study there. Also acting as well. Um, some, there's some brilliant acting, of course, in animated movies, so I'm always studying those as well. Um, but when it comes to face and that kind of thing, I'm mostly looking from, when it comes to posing, I'm mostly looking at like old Disney, um, like traditional animated movies because they just found like the pure essence of appeal in characters and like the graphic shapes that they have and just what what like brings out a charm in a character so I study a lot of that kind of thing um but then in terms of actually how the face moves I study life so there's a book which I have a pdf on I might be able to find it let's see if I can find it quickly for you um shouldn't take me a moment but it's really good um actually while you're searching for that i'll read you another it. question what sure. are some of the face polish tips from sean sexton that was the most helpful or mind-blowing to you um okay that's very good so good question uh so one of them is uh so, so sean sexton is like a lip sync god <laughs> so he 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 the way he describes himself because he's very good friends with james baxter and james baxter always goes to him for lip sync notes um and the way he kind of the way he treats things is wh whenever sean is watching a person most people look at someone's eyes but with sean he actually looks at their um he looks at their mouth and the, the, apparently there are books on this as well it's really weird but <laughs> he was he was going into it so he's very good with lip sync like he knows when lip sync is wrong um and so his tips he had for lip sync which were really useful was um to make when you're in polish to make something feel fleshy and or, and organic what he tends to do is he'll get the uh, the open rotation of the jaw and he'll copy that curve and he'll paste it onto the lower squash of the whole head and then he'll offset it by a frame or two and then it'll help it make it feel like it's got compression and volume to it um, he'll also like in terms of when the mouth opens it's going to narrow the corners of your mouth unless they have a loud shape like a loud sound so obviously if you go ah then you're going to have the wide corners. But if you're going like, oh, if I was to open my mouth now, the corners would naturally come in. So if I go, um, what else does he say? So he has, fra he has like fr different frames for eye darts. So if it's like a very tiny eye darts, he would dart over one frame. If he 
I dart it if it was like a like a medium I dart, I guess you could say. So going from like slightly left to slightly right, he would do it over three frames. So he'd have pose one is the first little main key pose. He'd have one frame to ease in, which would be very, very close to the second eye dart. And then you'd have your final pose in the eye dart. So three frame dart. And then if it was like from very far left to very far right, he would do it over five frames. So sometimes depending on the scenario, he'd have one frame to ease out, which would be tiny. And then one and one or two frames to ease in on the other side, which again would be very like tight spacing. Um, or he would have just, yeah, that's mostly, I think it's usually one to ease out and then two to ease in. Um, and that's what kind of naturally how your eyes would dart. Um, another good tip that he would say is um, your blink rate. So I can't remember now, I have the note somewhere. I don't want to give you the wrong answer. Um, I'm thinking in my head, I, can't, I don't want to give you the wrong answer to this. I know that babies blink a lot less because they're so like observing the world that their blink rate is super low. Like they only blink like once or twice a minute. Whereas I think human, I think normal adults blink something like, I think it's like, ah, oh, I think it's like 20 or something like that. We blink a lot. Um, I have to find out, but you can study it, like study blink rates in acting. Um, it's really interesting. He also say that like in, in order for an eye to focus, it needs four frames. So if you was doing a lot of like subtle eye darts on top of each other, it should at least have four frames of a held eye dart pose before you move on to the next one. That's like the bare minimum in real life that an eye needs to focus. Um, like if you watch in real life, someone darting their eyes around, it will never be like one, two, three, four, all in one frame after another kind of thing. Or like after two frames, it'd only be after four. Um, Trying to think of other things. Uh, just with the cheeks as well. If you've got the corners, the mouth corners, I'd copy the the translate X of the mouth corners coming in and out, and I'd copy that onto the cheeks and then offset it by a frame, so that as the corners come in, the cheeks will pull as well. Um, the same with the lower lid. So when you squint, like you can't, you can't naturally um, like lift your upper, your lower lid without uh, squinting. You can't just naturally lift your lower lid up. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. It depends on the style though. Like if you're doing very, very cartoony stuff, you can just pull an expression and it's more forgiving because it just sells the moment. Um, and it's more caricatured, so you're supposed to be exaggerating life. If you're going something that's slightly more like how to train a dragon, then they're a little more strict on how you would move the face around, so it'd be a little bit more based on reality. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much everything off the top of my head. Yeah, it's a great answer. Thank Thanks. <laughs> oh, do we have a question? Uh, am I a hi? Am I able to ask a quick question if that's all right? Go ahead. Uh, uh, really, really great talk, Aaron. It was fantastic. Um, Thank I was you very just, much. Uh, no problem. Uh, I was just asking about um, when you get to that stage where you're you're getting everything on twos. Yeah. Um, and then you're moving from that into kind of spline territory do you yes. find sometimes when you do that um it blends in quite well together and it's not as difficult to to kind of clean up and then do you find that there are other times where it's completely different from what you were expecting and if so yeah. how do you handle that sure so the reason i kind of put it on twos is hopefully so that i don't get anything unexpected but obviously you do it depends on your workflow sometimes the way you tackle a rig can like give you slightly more unpredictable results. Yeah. Um, but generally the cleanup process for me is quite, it's easy. I would say mm -hmm. if like, I'd say it's easy, but it's also very time consuming. Yeah. Um, so like 
for me at least the blocking and like the in-between process is very fast as long as I've got the idea in mind yeah um but so for example if I was on twos I'd when I'm when I'm doing everything on twos the main thing I'm looking at are like the main control so I'd be looking at this in this case this character I'd be looking at his roots and then like his three main fk uh joints going up the spine yeah. then the neck and then the head it's like those i would make sure that all my curves were clean or like those are the main things i'm focusing on in my in my twos process yeah and then i'd go from there like fk arms etc um and occasionally i'll find on a secondary control or maybe even on the arms even in these controls they're not going to be perfect just by eye because I'm doing it on twos and I'm just using Twee Machine and a lot of it is kind of guess work in terms of cleanup. Yeah. Um, so occasionally I'll get a curve where it goes up and then it like differs in that kind of thing. And all I would do is go into A tools and it has like an EA symbol which is easy and out. And I'll okay. just grab those keys and just fix it so that it did like a nice clean tangent. Um, unless that was, unless the bump was intentional. Yeah. Um, but I would do that on every act, every channel. So I'd just go through the roots first cause I'd go up the spine. So I'd go up the roots and then I'd do all the passes and the translate and the rotate. And then again, I'd do it up on the next one. I'd literally just go up the chain and clean up all the main controls. And then, so those are the main things I'm looking at are like the feet, the knees, and then the FK joints on like the hands and the elbows and then the shoulders, like those are my main controls that I focus on. Yeah. And then once I go into polish, that's when I would add the extra secondary controls and I would start to sculpt shapes a bit more. So like I would do a pass once I've got it on, like once I've done cleanup on twos and I can hit spline and it looks how I expect it. I would do what I call like a beauty pass where I would try and like tweak my poses so that they would look like an illustration. So like if this curve was naturally like a bit more sharp and I didn't want it to be, I would try and just smooth that out. Like in my key poses, I'd just go from key pose to key pose and like create more appealing shapes. So I'd get my like straights and curves um, and try and flesh out a bit more like anatomy kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like my beauty pass after I've done my spline pass, but mostly it's just using a tools. If your workflow is clean enough, then you shouldn't have too many unexpected results when you go into spline. Most of the case for me is just retiming and spacing. Um, if something's not punchy enough or something's, um, or something's too sharp that kind of thing. So it's just tweaking up the curves or the keys and just like adding or removing keys here and there just to get my rhythm right. Cool. Wicked. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks for your question, mate. Um, I think you were looking for a PDF or a book, Aaron. Oh yeah, I was, wasn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's uh, asking about it. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I shall find that. I think I think I remember where it is now. Just give me one moment. Um, do, 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 do. Anyone else has questions? Feel free to jump on. Yeah, the please do. Don't be shy. Aaron wants to meet you. Do I? <laughs> Can I find it? Aha! I found it. Okay. So this is a PDF, you can find it online. It's called Anatomy of Expression, uh, Anatomy of Facial Expressions. Um, I'll just go to the top so you can see the front cover. But it's super useful. There you go. I'm pretty sure if you just type that in and then put PDF afterwards, it will just give you a free download. You don't, well you could buy the book if you really want to support them. Um, I was intending to, and then I was looking on Amazon and I just found this random link and I was like, oh, I'll just take that instead. <laughs> um, but this is a really good book. Um, kind of goes through the anatomy, 
like the skull stuff not so, like i'm not so concerned about that's more a modeling thing like it has a lot of good tips for modeling and rigging in here as well but what i'm mostly looking for is later with the expressions so this stuff is useful so to show you like in here how it's actually taking 3d scans of people's faces and then they're drawing over the top to show you like the muscles and how they're responding um and this one's really useful especially this one here i would recommend to every animator is that the brows don't just translate up and down but they have a like a muscle that goes out to the sides of the head so as when you furrow down it becomes flat more flat and then as it lifts up it bends out um and that's what i would use on the main on the main uh, brow control as i'm moving that around i'd make sure that as i'm lifting up it's coming out um so just by default when i start setting up a rig i would just rotate on the z the brows slightly so that when i translate up and down it wouldn't just go directly up it would go slightly out to the head um then it's got like how the brow like how the brows would furrow on the inside like it's really good um it goes into like actual expressions as well um it's really, really yeah it's really good look um got a squint so you can see the comparisons see how everything's compressing um i'll just show you a bit more about the actual so this one's pretty good so you can see like a, quite a common thing that i'll see um with some animation it depends on the style again but if you're going for something more natural then when the eyes look down the lids should follow down with it because the lids like everything has a, like a structure to it and the skin folds with the eyeball and it slides slightly um, and so you got to make sure that the lids are always connected to the eye direction so i see a lot that when people look down with characters they don't drop the eyelids um when they're doing like natural stuff and it instantly looks wrong so that's something to look out for um, you can see here it's showing you kind of like how things are twisting in um, when they're looking down which is cool so this one's really cool i only started using this recently but it's really cool like a really useful tip is if you so this is a neutral eye pose and you can see that the so you've got this is something i would do before is that the upper lid would favor the apex on the inside so the eyes shouldn't ever feel wall-eyed they should always have a slight focus to the center so whenever i'm moving the eye controls i make sure that the individual left and right eye on that on that main eye control are slightly in, in. that way it makes the eyes feel like they have focus um, and then also i make sure that the eyelid is always following the apex of the iris so on here you can see that that arch there isn't dead in the middle but it's slightly on the inside because that's where the focus of the iris is but one thing that I only figured out recently is that when the eye darts, like when the eye changes direction, so let's say in this case it's going far left, what I used to do is put the apex on both the bottom and the top. But in real life, the lower lid doesn't change influence on its apex. Like it always stays in, in the middle. And I never knew that until, until I found this book. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. So now whenever I try and create an eye shape, I will add a slight change in shape on the lower lid just so it has a bit more appeal. But for the most part, I don't try and change the apex too much on the bottom, it's mostly on the top. Um, what else? So you've got like sneers. Literally, it goes through everything, but I'll just quickly show you at the bottom. So you've got like M shapes and it shows you profile, like different mug shots like different phonemes so you've got b's p's m's puffs it's awesome it's literally like it's designed for animators even though it wasn't written for animators <laughs> uh 
I don't really use this so much anymore, like this actual book, unless I've got a very specific expression that I'm struggling to pose and just make feel connected. Like I'd mostly look at this for polish, but for the most part, I feel like I've looked through this book enough now that I have a decent range of like knowledge when it comes to um, face expressions. But this is really cool. So it goes through like a smile on different age ranges and different, obviously different facial pro pro uh, proportions and everything. Um, and it'll show you like neutral to like big smile. Um, and just like, this is like, they have different appeals to them and what kind of suits their proportions and design, like design, but you know what I mean, um, how they look. So it's, yeah, it's really interesting to study. Like you can see here, like the navel uh, libial, I can't remember how you pronounce that now. I think it's like nasal lib libial flare or something. But this crease, <laughs> this crease here is way more defined on this guy than it is on this guy. And it's a lot broader, like you see how much that dents in. And so that's something that maybe you could think about in your character, look at his design and when he smiles, maybe that would really def be redefined or maybe it wouldn't be. Like that's, those are things that you can think about. Like no person moves the same. Like see how much his outer, outer, uh, upper lip flares out here in his smile compared to hers, which is much more relaxed. But yeah, it goes from like different expressions as well. So you've got angry. I almost wish they picked the same people for each expression, but it goes through different people each time. I guess they had different ranges. So you got surprise. Uh, shock. Like angry. This one's really good. So on the first photo of each one, it's going to show you a 3D scan of the person in neutral and then when they're angry and then it's showing you which muscles are pulling in which directions to to like perform that expression so it's almost giving you the answer to how you should be moving your controls around and this is kind of what i was saying about the how you use the sub controls the secondary controls on the lips is that they should pull out in these directions you shouldn't be moving them in a different way because then the lips start to feel disconnected, which is the mistake I was making on dragons. And that's why it took so many iterations on my face, on my lip sync, because the, I just wasn't moving the controls around how it should be. Um, but yeah, that's the book. Really, really good. Anything else? Nice one. That's a, that's a good find. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Oh, I'll well wrap it up pretty soon because I can yeah. see it's 9.30 p.m. for It's you. probably going to be getting really late for some people. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Nope. Maybe we'll just wrap it up there then. Just to... Just because it's late, man.